and welcome once again to The Blueprints. This is Canada's Conservative Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Schmale, Member of Parliament for Halliburton Court, the Lakes Brock, with new content for you every single Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We do appreciate you being here, and if you can't listen to the entire program right this second, download it, listen to it on platforms like CastBox, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, you name it, it is out there. We have a great show. We're going to talk about C5. We're talking about the Liberals' soft on crime. We're also talking about the Emergencies Act and the information that has come forward in the last few weeks. So with this content, we ask that you like, comment, subscribe, share this program. Together we can push back against that ever-moving liberal agenda. So today, two amazing guests. We have two former lawyers, believe it or not. Don't hold that against us. We have Larry Brock right here, Member of Parliament for Brantford Brant in the beautiful province of Ontario. Also the Shadow Minister, just so I get it right, the Attorney General of Canada. And of course, we have Frank Caputo right beside him, the Member of Parliament for Thompson, Ah, I knew I was going to mess up. Cam Loops, Thompson Caribou, also the Shadow Minister for Veterans Affairs and the Associate Minister for National Defense, but as I mentioned, former lawyers as well. So last week, you probably saw it on social media, Larry Brock here had the Deputy Prime Minister, the Finance Minister of Canada, Chrystia Freeland, in front of committee exploring the Emergencies Act and how the government made that decision to get the Emergencies Act. So, Larry, if you haven't watched it, go on his social media uh, platforms, listen and watch that speech. It is telling how uh, dismissive the government is towards questions by Conservative members. So, Larry, what did you get out of committee? What were you feeling? To me, watching that was actually shameful because we need to know why the government invoked the act. Thank you for that question and thank you for the opportunity of, of being on this important podcast. I feel very privileged and honored to uh, participate in this examination, a very serious examination of the government's role in the invocation of the act. We've taken a solemn oath that we would safeguard all confidential information which on the surface would presume then that we would have access to cabinet confidentiality documents, solicitor client uh, documents, things of that nature. What has been happening over the course of several weeks is that high ranking uh, senior government officials as well as ministers have been hiding behind those two principles, solicitor client privilege, cabinet confidentiality, in terms of blocking our ability to dig deep into issues. And from my perspective, with my legal background, the biggest issue that I want to be able to answer, was there sufficient grounds, legally sufficient grounds, to invoke the act? So the focus of my line of questioning is to basically dig deep into that issue and explore areas by asking ministers, by asking senior government officials, questions that will help us answer that question. So far, Jamie, it has been a stonewall uh, effort by the government to hide behind those principles. As a lawyer, I understand the principles, but this is a one-in-a-lifetime event. It's never been used, the invocation of the Emergencies Act, and there are, there are basically exceptions. Government can waive cabinet confidentiality. The client, being the government, can waive solicitor-client privilege. We want to get to the truth. So yesterday was extremely hopeful for me that having two senior government officials, I would be able to address some of the false narratives that we've been hearing, uh, particularly over the last several weeks. For instance, in my focus of, Christia, or of Minister Freeland, <clears throat> was whether or not there were sufficient legal grounds to invoke the economic measures to freeze the bank accounts. Well, we all know that the talking point by the minister herself, as well as the prime minister and other senior ministers, was that the funding for the, go for the platforms that funded the donations came from outside the country. There was an element of terrorist financing or anti-laundering fa financing. There was even a reference to Russian-backed influencers behind this convoy. So I wanted to dig deep into those issues. Minister Freeland had her own agenda. She had her own narrative. I tried with the limited amount of time that we have, which is frustrating anywhere, depending on the round, four to five minutes to keep her on track. And I was accused of badgering the witness. All I did was remind the minister, this wasn't question period. This was a committee who's expected to receive 
answers to relevant questions. And the questions I put to the minister, in my opinion, were relevant. We did not get answers. Frustrating. Complete opposite to uh, Minister Blair, who was, uh, by default, very responsive, very substantive in his responses, and I thanked him for contributing to a, to a discussion and to aid us in determining what transpired, what caused the government to invoke the act. So it's pretty clear at this point, Jamie, with the narrative that we've been hearing that the press is now picking up, is that Minister Mendocino has purposely and deliberately misled not only the House, which is a very serious matter, but has misled Canadians that it was law enforcement who had asked for the invocation of the act, amongst other issues. But th that is a big takeaway that we are pursuing at the Emergencies Act Committee. Well, Frank, last week in question period, you were up asking for Minister Mendicino to resign because of that fact. I asked for Minister Mendicino to resign over um, everything that we've heard discussed and uh, it's something that I had no problem doing in the, in the circumstances. So his comments to the House of Commons, as Larry just mentioned, police forces asked for the Emergencies Act to come into effect. Yes. We, we just haven't found one that has said yes. Yes, I don't, I don't have his exact quotes in front of me, yeah. but that was certainly the message that, that I felt was conveyed. Yeah, so you, you, the, 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 again, if you haven't watched that exchange, I, go, I urge you to go to Frank's social media. There was a bit of a heated exchange. Uh, you had called for the resignation. I, he didn't really like that, and uh, it went back and forth. So Yes, it's uh, good to be passionate on both sides sometimes. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So as we continue this, we, so we've, we've got still the investigation to the Emergencies Act going on. We're still working to, uh, as mentioned, find the truth here, which it seems that it's very hard to find at this point. On top of that, the Liberals introduced a couple of pieces of legislation that just completely goes, I, in my opinion, in, 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 in keeping the criminals, the repeat violent offenders behind bars. It just seems that this revolving door that we have at this point, C-75 passed in a previous parliament, reduced sentences. We have C-5 now. The list just keeps going on and on. Like when. What do people have to do to stay in jail nowadays under these, these Liberals? That's a question to me, Jane? It can be to whoever. It <laughs> okay. can be both. Well, I just, want to, I just want to clarify. Not only are, are Frank and I both lawyers, we are both uh, former Crown attorneys. Yes. And uh, in that particular role, both of us have very passionately uh, and professionally advocated for holding offenders accountable regardless of their infraction from shoplifting all the way to homicide and everything in between while at the same time preserving the rights of victims and aiding them through the process. So it's been a very honorable path that I have chosen and I'm sure I can speak for Frank as well that he's really enjoyed uh, his public service uh, to his ministry. So um, in my speech last week on C5, actually two weeks ago on C5, I started off by indicating how deeply ashamed I was, not only as a parliamentarian, but as a former Crown attorney, that this soft on crime, <coughs> agenda driven, driven uh, liberal government has chose to put communities at risk from coast to coast to coast. One of the driving factors for me to leave a 30 year career in law was I was tired of simply following the law and I was seeing victims falling further and further behind in their pursuit for justice. And I felt what better way to actually contribute to changing that narrative by becoming a politician. Right now, in my view, the criminal justice pendulum has shifted so far to the right in terms of favoring the accused, giving rights to the accused. We only need to take a look at the most two recent Supreme Court of Canada decisions to really mm -hmm. emphasize that particular point. So the thrust of my speech in the House was trying to achieve a balance. C5 doesn't even come close to mm -hmm. that particular balance. The narrative the government is using is not the details contained within C5. It is not legislation deemed to impact those low-risk right. first-time offenders, and we often heard that numerous times, but more importantly, again, <clears throat> their ideological-driven agenda 
and which I wholeheartedly agree to on this particular point, that we have a problem in this country with the over-incarceration of Indigenous men, women, youth, and other marginalized individuals. <clears throat> so to that end, I agree, it is a problem. And it's incumbent not only on politicians, it's incumbent upon various ministries, various provinces, various agencies, to, and, and, and the judiciary to take active steps to really address that issue without compromising the community safety. C5 talks about that issue in general terms, but when you take a look at the crimes that they've actually eliminated, mandatory minimum penalties, the most serious gun offenses, the most serious drug offenses, taking away now the ability of people to be precluded from conditional sentence considerations. What the thrust again of my speech in, in the House, Jamie, was that it doesn't matter what sort of background you have, what race you have, what ethnicity that you may have, whether you have a criminal background or not, you get convicted of drive-by shootings, you get convicted of trafficking in fentanyl, or production of car fentanyl, where a grain, the size of a grain of salt of car fentanyl, can kill an elephant. You get convicted of that. It doesn't matter whether you're indigenous. It doesn't matter whether you're a marginalized individual. The default position is going to be jail. There is sentencing principles of denunciation, deterrence, and separation from society that, that are at play. So while on the one hand, I agree with the principle that we need to take active steps to address that, C5 does the opposite. Well, also in C5, they, they changed a few things and made a bunch of pretty serious crimes into what amounts to house arrest here. The one I find just kind of laughable is the one where you can break out of jail and then get house arrest for breaking out of jail. How does that make any sense? No, that's a, that's a quite a serious offense. Um, the, the one that really strikes me, Jamie, is uh, Section 244.2, if memory serves, which is discharge with intent or reckless discharge. Now, discharge with intent is with intent to maim, wound, or endanger life. In other words, you are shooting at somebody to cause a final outcome. Very, very serious. So uh, it's probably one of the most serious gun crimes that you can have that you don't actually have to pre prove a resulting outcome of, of, of death or bodily harm or anything. Commonly a drive-by shooting or reckless discharge shooting at a house that you're indifferent as to whether it's occupied or not. Um, I, I believe with a prohibited firearm, it used to be a five-year mandatory minimum. I, I don't believe that one was touched, but I believe that a non-prohibited or non-restricted firearm, um, now there is no mandatory minimum on that, if memory serves, Jamie. And that's really, it's a serious offense that, that you could have something like that. Now, what I advocated for, and I think it's a middle ground, because I agree, we need to deal with the over-representation of certain groups in jail. You will never, ever get an argument from me on that. Um, we have principles like Gladue, um, Gladue being a, a case in the Supreme Court of Canada in the 90s. I took great pride in upholding Gladue and applying Gladue whenever I was dealing with an offender for whom Gladue applied. I had no issue with that whatsoever. So what I advocated for is this. I said, why don't you have a mandatory minimum with what's called a safety valve or an exceptional circumstances provision? What that means is, is that you can have the appropriate middle ground. Because what the government is saying is, we're, we're avoiding these outcomes of over-representation. And I said, well, you could still do that by having this exceptional circumstances. What you do is you impose a mandatory minimum, but you say, if somebody meets these exceptional circumstances based on socioeconomic status, uh, gladue principles, things like that, that then a judge has discretion mm -hmm. in, in to, to not apply the mandatory minimum. Mm -hmm. So we can, the people for whom this minimum was designed for, people who, who really are a danger, they will go to jail for a protracted period of time to protect the public for the reasons in Section 718 of the Criminal Code. But those people, that narrow group that the government is saying, look, we need to, to address this group, then the judge would have discretion because the government kept mm -hmm. on saying, Jamie, we, we need to give judges the discretion. And I said, well, you will give judges the discretion with that so we can accommodate both things. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the government didn't act on that. I had hoped that yeah. they had, but that would be, that would be much, fair and reasonable. Yeah. I, I would have been selling that to caucus yeah. instantaneously if we did because yeah. 
when you look at the reasons why some of these previous offenses, like Section 95 of the Code, uh, were struck down, that's having a, a, a prohibited or restricted firearm loaded or with readily accessible ammunition. They were struck down for these potentially narrow reasons. Mm -hmm. Somebody who forgot to have their, their, their gun license renewed, their possession acquisition license. Yeah. These are really, really narrow things. And the other thing, too, that the government didn't talk about in their talking points is that we're only talking about indictable offenses, mm -hmm. that there's a discretion to proceed what we call summarily for a lot of these offenses, not for reckless discharge, things like that, but for other offenses. There is that discretion to proceed summarily, which means that the, the Crown is treating it as less serious versus indictable, more serious, similar to misdemeanor felony in the United States. Final point to, to mm -hmm. add to, uh, to Frank's commentary on that point of giving judges discretion. I framed it as a constitutional exemption within 718, Section 718 itself. I proposed that at the committee, Justice Committee, for which I sit on, and uh, it was you know, welcomed by committee members as far as the, the conservative members were concerned, as well as the bloc, but the liberals flat out refused to even consider it. In fact, it was dismissed summarily by the chair, so there was not any consideration whatsoever. So we've had a, a conversation around misleading Parliament, misleading Canadians. It went into soft on crime and where the Liberals are taking the justice portfolio. Then I think we transition, and probably our last topic, we we're running out of time, would be C21, a piece of legislation where at the same time really clamps down on legal law-abiding firearms owners, where we've just let the violent repeat offenders get house arrest in some cases, or lenient sentences, but yet those following the law are getting clamped down even more. And I'll give you both time to, to comment if you want. Well, very, very briefly, if I may, um, C-21 does not deal with the proverbial elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is the illegal smuggling mm -hmm. of guns across our porous, and I highlight that term, our porous borders. Uh, criminals are always two or three steps ahead uh, they know that perhaps when the government is putting more resources into border agents, giving them greater search powers, putting in more money for a concerted uh, intelligence uh, operation with the American authorities, we hear stories of criminals using drones to bypass the borders altogether and dropping illegal guns. We know statistically crime has gone up substantially since the Liberals have taken power. Homicides in all our major centers have skyrocketed and at least 90% of the homicides across this country are being used with illegal guns. So while 21 talks about some small measures the government is taking, it's not the focus. The focus really is to put a freeze, not a ban, mm -hmm. but a freeze on the purchase, the sale, the transfer of existing handguns that are being properly yeah, used and no enjoyed will have no impact on crime. None. Did you want to comment? Uh, well, one, I, I know we're, we're running short on time, so I'll leave you with this, Jamie. Mm -hmm. I looked at Section C5 and Section C21, and maybe I missed it, but I didn't see any reference to victims. Uh, I was going to bring that up, yes. And uh, that's something that we, we, we need not forget. Uh, there are a lot of people who are um, victimized, and they're completely innocent. They didn't choose a life that involved um, firearms or illegal firearms. They didn't choose a life that, that would have led them to ordinarily be victimized. And we can't forget that when we're debating this legislation. I always give the guests the last word. So if you want to talk about this or anything else, uh, we'll start with uh, Larry. Uh, the floor is yours. As Conservatives, we will continue to put the needs of victims first and keep our communities safe. We will never stop fighting for that balance that I'm trying to achieve. Here, here. Yes, I couldn't have said it any better myself. Thank you very much, Gene. Perfect. Well, great to talk to some former prosecutors, and uh, I really appreciate your contribution. And again, I really encourage you, if you haven't already, check out their social media posts because their speeches, uh, the questions in the House from Frank, 
Yeah, Larry, his, his questioning of uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Christian Freeland, was absolutely amazing in trying to get to the bottom of some of these very important questions. Again, if you like the content, please like, comment, subscribe, share this program. Together we can push back against the ever-moving Liberal agenda. We have new content for you every single Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. If you can't listen or watch it in its entirety right this second, download it. Listen to it on platforms like CastOps, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify. You name it, it is out there. Thank you very much, Larry Brock, Member of Parliament for Brantford Brant, also the Deputy Shadow Minister for the Attorney General, and also Frank Caputo. I will get his riding right this time. Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou, and the beautiful province of British Columbia, also the uh, Shadow Minister for Veterans Affairs and Associate Minister of National Defense. As always, low taxes, less government, more freedom. That's the blueprint.